All right, secret handshakes. I'm calling this secret handshakes because when you join a secret society, a lot of times you are taught subtle ways to indicate to other people that you are part of that society. And there are a handful of grammar, punctuation rules that um, show that you get it, that you are part of the society of people who are, mm, I guess, educated would be kind of a condescending way of putting it, but uh, that you have retained a lot of knowledge from English class. And frankly, a lot of these rules are not explicitly taught in English class because they just are forgotten about or they're just not listed in, in standards that teachers um, are required to cover. But I'm going to cover all these with you. And I hope that you use as many of these as possible in your own writing and correspondence. And a lot of times people will not notice them, but the people who do notice them, their esteem in you will rise, I promise. Uh, so secret handshakes. So let's begin. I'm trying to order these in order of um, common to least common. The first ones are gonna deal with um, more punctuation and spelling. I'm gonna get into style at the end. All right, the first one, this is the most common secret handshake is the direct address comma. Okay, so as I, I have a link here that you can go to to see more examples, but it's pretty simple. When you're addressing somebody in a sentence, the, the, it is set off by a comma when you're addressing them. So even if it's as simple as, hi, Dan, it should be hi, comma, Dan, period. I have had students argue that that looks uh, awkward and my my retort is what's so awkward about correct grammar. I don't understand. Um, I just don't understand that stylistic bugaboo on their part. Uh, so for example, Good Night Moon. I, I used to read that book to my son, but it just drove me nuts, the lack of a comma throughout the direct address comma. It should be good night, comma, moon, because we are saying good night to the moon. That shirt that I saw in Target, I've got you, babe. There should be a comma there. They probably left it out because they were like, well, a comma would look weird on this shirt. I'm not buying the shirt. I'm not buying it for my wife. Uh, the, however, we look at the movie Hello, Dolly. They have the comma. Very good. The famous, when this is taught, a lot of times there's the famous sentence, let's eat grandpa, where if you don't use the comma, you are advocating literally cannibalizing and consuming your grandpa. If you use the comma, you are asking grandpa, let's eat. So that's a easy way to remember it. But in email correspondence, 90% of people leave it out. And whether you choose to use it or not is up to you. But those who are aware of it and take note of people who use it will silently see that secret handshake when you choose to correctly use the direct address comma. All right. Uh, here's another one that people just carelessly get wrong all the time. And I, I mean, I don't think I need to even teach this, but here's a reminder. <laughs> it's without the apostrophe in it is possessive. For example, the car is green. It's former owner had a real thing for green. It's with the apostrophe is a contradiction or a contraction rather of it is. It's a pleasure to meet you. All right. It's counterintuitive because in most other instances, the apostrophe indicates possession, but in this it doesn't without it is what indicates possession. So just take that little bit of time to retain that knowledge and use it. And that, that little bit of competency will, will work wonders with a few people. And they could be people who might wanna hire you. Uh, okay, avoid ending sentences with prepositions. This is a, uh, I, this is stylistic, but it is something that I think if you're a little conscious of, you hopefully could stamp this out of your writing. I, I used to teach when I taught uh, English 10, I would talk about the idea that when you order your ideas, you always want to leave the most emphatic ideas at the end of your sentences, at the ends of your paragraphs, and you want to end your entire paper or correspondence with a strong, meaningful idea. And I think that's where the concept of not ending sentences with prepositions arose from, because it's just a really lame way to end a, a sentence with of or in. So that's why they try to teach you not to do that because you want to end with the most important idea, but it's not the end of the world if you do that. Often though, when you look at your sentences, when you're talking or writing, the prepositions that you are ending your sentences 
with, <laughs> the prepositions with which you're ending your sentences are not necessary. So for example, where are you traveling to? You could just say, where are you traveling? So I will just say, try to avoid ending sentences with prepositions. And uh, as an English teacher, I don't really fuss at my students for it, but I do take note of students who take the time to revise their sentences to end emphatically with ideas. Prepositions don't really, they facilitate ideas. They don't really carry anything with them inherently. Okay, uh, here's something that is a rule that if you screw up, you look, you're really um, uh, showing, how do I express this um, school friendly? You're looking silly if you do this incorrectly, a dangling modifier. So the definition is when a descriptive dependent clause begins a sentence, the subject must begin the subsequent independent clause. It's a very uh, convoluted explanation. It's easier to look at it. So this is incorrect. Purring loudly and carrying a mouse, I was pleased to see my cat enter the room. So when you read it, you probably understand it, but grammatically, purring loudly and carrying mouse, it's implying that I was the one doing that that I was purring loudly and carrying a mouse, but no. It should, the sentence should be revised, purring loudly and carrying a mouse, my cat entered the room, which pleased me, or something like that. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. If you wanna practice it, I have a link right there for you to practice it. But a lot of people will uh, start those descriptive dependent clauses and sometimes forget that the subject of the descriptive dependent clause must begin the independent clause. All right, dangling modifiers, gotta avoid them. Okay, now here's, here's a rule that is rather complicated, but worth understanding for meticulous expression. Fewer, the word fewer versus the word less. Fewer is only used when discussing countable things. This recipe has fewer ingredients. The ingredients can in fact be counted. I earned fewer dollars than my brother over the summer. The dollars that we earned can be counted. Now there's a subtle difference that we're gonna look at in just a sec. There were fewer people at the party than last time. Mm, however, less is used for singular mass nouns, as well as money, weight, and time. So when we talk about money, we say I make less money than my brother because the idea of money is more of a mass concept. When we talk about the exact dollars and cents, you can use fewer because those are countable. Uh, put less salt on your food. So you wouldn't say put fewer salt on your food because the salt is not countable. Those individual grains, if you, I mean, some would argue that it's countable, but they're crazy. Uh, my parents showed less love to me than my sister. That's something, love cannot be counted, right? My parents showed less love to me my sister okay so you use fewer when it can be counted less when it can't be counted when you go to the grocery store a lot of times they screw this up they have the little 10 items or less it should be 10 items or fewer and they probably made the intentional decision to not use a fancy word because they want to seem like the common man the common english language speaking person who doesn't use english correctly that's that's what i've come to believe uh and you, you hear you just see it so often used incorrectly and when you see it when you see people using it correctly as an english teacher um, but also just as a a person who values precise expression it makes you feel happy that people are part of this society of the educated right and i'm not saying i'm educated um you get the idea the color gray they never teach this in school that I'm aware of. I had a student ask me one time and I didn't know the answer and I looked it up and now I teach it to my students because why not know this rule? Because it's an interesting rule and it's fun to lord over people, right? In America, we spell it gray with an A. In England, they spell it gray with an E. That's, it's a very easy way to remember it. A for America, E for England. And then uh, this is a, a nice little one that you can correct other people and then they'll Google it and they'll be like, oh gee, I didn't know that rule, and you do, and you gain a subtle advantage over them. Mm, here's uh, another one related to those differences um, between American English language and the English that they speak 
over or across the pond. When we use prepositions that end with ward, W-A-R-D, when we write them, we don't include an S at the end here in America. And when you look at professional publications, such as um, newspapers, magazines, anything that has that pays somebody to edit it, they will make sure this rule is enforced. And then everywhere else, people uh, don't abide by this rule. Americans don't. Because, and here's why, when you say these words, I fell backward, you wouldn't say back, you would say backwards. But when you write it, you don't include the S in America if you are abiding by this rule and you want to be in the secret handshake society, right? As I note down here in all caps, the ultimate secret handshake rule. If you understand this and use it, it is it is the most subtle and deep cut of these rules, in my opinion, from my experience. And there might be, I'm not saying this is the definitive list. This is after 11 years of teaching English and slowly accumulating these, but I find that students enjoy learning these and implementing them. Mm, okay. Every day versus every day, two words. So every day, one word is an adjective and therefore it modifies a noun. This is my everyday Rolex. So it modifies Rolex. Whereas every day is an adverb Therefore, it modifies a verb. I wear my Rolex every day. So in that case, it's modifying wear, like when I wear it every day. That is a, that's, and I once, oh boy, I'll tell you what, I remember like it was yesterday. It was almost a decade ago, the New York Times food section published a headline that made this mistake. And I tweeted at them, correcting them. They never acknowledged the tweet, but they did revise the headline. So, um, Little petty triumphs like that is what you can gain from knowing these little secret handshakes. You're welcome. Okay, uh, moving on. A lot. Pretty, no, I don't have much to say about this other than it's two words. Two words, a lot. And I value you and my esteem in you rises if you recognize that subtlety. Uh, informal conversation, a lot of times people render it as one word. But even when you pronounce it, you use two syllables a lot. It's not a lot, right? So I'm, I'm never, I've got a lot. I don't know. It probably originates from the idea of a lot being a, hold on, I'm looking it up. Some unit of measurement in England, perhaps. Where's the definition of a lot? What word were we looking up the other day? And I like nailed it. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep going. Google didn't define it for me. Oh, wait, 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 all right, yeah, now define. Nope, huh. So the singular of lot is a particular group, collection, or set of people or things an article or set of articles for sale at an auction. So if you have a lot, it's a collection, a set, a group. Um, anyway, you don't need to know. You just need to know if you want to abide by these secret handshakes that it's two words. All right is two words as well. This all right is informal. Is that Kendrick Lamar's song? All right, one word. We'll forgive them because it's a good song. All right, now, and now we move to uh, subtle uh, grammar rules that are, are less about secret handshakes and more just competently understanding how to use them. Uh, when to use a colon. Here are the two times I would advise that you use a colon. It should always follow an independent clause and it should be used in the place of the phrase, and they are, or in place of the word, because. I hate all my brothers, colon, Aaron, Matthew, and Nick. So the colon replaces the phrase, and they are. There are two reasons to go to college, and they are to learn more and make friends. Or you can use it in place of the word, because. I couldn't go to school because the roads were iced over and the car wouldn't start. No one believes Ellen because she has a history of lying. Um, when do you use a semicolon? Here's my advice. 
you want to be part of the secret handshake society, I would advise avoiding using semicolons. I liken them to a bow tie in the sense that bow ties are proper for very formal occasions. And if you were to try to wear them in other settings, you would look very foolish. And most students, when they try to use semicolons, they, you, they misuse them so often. And when you do that, as I note up here, you look both ignorant and pretentious. It's like language is supposed to be about expressing ideas. And if you're trying to mm, make yourself look like the little kid wearing the adults, you know, uh, jacket or, or clothes you're, you're by using semicolons, you're really just showing, you're not showing your best self. So just avoid using them. Uh, and often semicolons d d make ideas too dense because they're, they're not letting ideas and sentences breathe. Most, most apprentice writers, high school writers, don't um, fully have a grasp yet of how good writing should have a conversational flow in the same way that we take pauses when we speak and we do not, most of us, the most persuasive speakers vary the pacing at which they deliver their sentences. So they might start with a short sentence, then they will continue with a longer sentence, branching with many subsequent uh, dependent clauses, but then they'll end with a short sentence, right? Um, and so semicolons, a lot of times students are trying to link together lots of ideas that probably would be better being separated uh, for the ease of comprehension. The parallel structure is something that sometimes people aren't aware of and therefore they, they botch the construction. So um, a, a lot of times it's when providing a list, but you can use parallel structure in the way that you're consistently beginning sentences for, for emphasis. And in Lang, sometimes teachers will teach these fancy words to describe specific types of parallel structure. I don't do that because it's not worth knowing to succeed on the test. With the ING form, gerund of words, Mary likes hiking, swimming, bicycling, that's parallel because they all have the same grammatical form. Uh, parallel implies like equal distance, like if two lines are parallel, they are always the same distance between each other for infinity. And I think there's some sort of like correlation grammatically to that. Mm, with infinitive phrases, Mary likes to hike, to swim, to ride a bicycle. Or you could write it, she likes to hike, swim, ride a bicycle. Um, so the way to get it wrong is to mix forms. She likes hiking, swimming, and to ride a bicycle. That's not parallel. And that it it makes the ideas harder to follow because all of a sudden your brain is processing these gerund constructions and all of a sudden you have the infinitive construction and you have to shift gears. No pun intended. So parallel. Mary likes hiking, swimming, riding advice. That's the correct version. Another stylistic choice that I advise you making is as much as possible, try to write using the active voice. Um, and if you're going to use the passive voice, do it consciously. So when I say the active voice, I mean the subject is performing the action. The dog bit the mailman. Well, if you were to write it in passive voice, the subject is receiving the action. The mailman was bitten by the dog. A lot of times when people are trying to be evasive or not take responsibility, they resort to the passive uh, voice. When people say mistakes were made, as opposed to saying I made mistakes, the active voice would say, I made mistakes. Passive voice would be mistakes were made by me, right? Um, and understanding a difference between the two um, verb constructions can just make your writing better because the more conscious you are of how you use it, um, the better. I had a professor in college who was just fanatical about never using passive construction. And there's certainly a place for it in my opinion uh, just don't overuse it and be conscious when you are using it because it makes your writing seem passive. Like if you're an emotionally passive person, that's not a lot of times a good thing. You want to be active and taking charge and you want your writing to do that. Is that it? Are those the only? All right, good. So thus far, those are my secret handshakes that I 
would love for you to implement in your own writing. If you come away with nothing else from my videos and from taking having me as a teacher, um, if you just took these away and implemented them in your writing, I think you'd be setting yourself up for a decent amount of success. Assuming the audience to whom you are writing <laughs> is also aware of these secret handshakes, but you'll find that mm, people who attend uh, the good schools, I didn't attend good schools when I know these. So um, I guess I should say people in positions of power a lot of times are um, aware of details and understanding these details is valuable. And when they see that, they might not even consciously recognize it, but they might um, subconsciously, it might trigger them to know that, hey, this person gets it and I want to hire them or I want them to be part of my secret society. Uh, so that's the value of them. Is there anything else I need to say about this? Secret handshakes. Yeah, that's it.